Hello everyone and welcome back. Yesterday we could not uh, finish the lecture by Conrad on survival analysis because of some technical problems. So today we are uh, going to do the same tutorial again and I hope no technical issues happen this time. Right, Conrad? Same here. Same here. Okay, it seems like the technical issues have already started. <laughs> oh, got a rudling. You're cutting off. Okay, so we are back. So uh, without further ado, let's get started with survival analysis. Yes. Uh, hello. So let's start with survival analysis. Uh, there will be a little bit of a repetition because I'm not sure what's the overlap between the audience yesterday and today. Uh, so survival analysis originated generally in medical sciences where this was a matter of calculating uh, when would patients that were observed, observed at different points in time would fall sick and when would they recover, etc. Uh, but since then, the whole topic has uh, extended into way more than that. Uh, I will be probably us using occasionally phrases like survival and patient interchangeably with case and time to event. So, uh, well, please bear with me. The, the why do we talk about it uh, in the context of time series? Because if you look at this graph here, this is what you might typically observe if you are dealing with survival analysis, the, the kind of data that belongs in the realm of survival analysis. Say P1 to P5 will be our patients and then annual checkups. What we typically see is that say patient one, nothing, nothing interesting and then became sick in 2019 and remained so throughout the duration of the sample. Nothing happened for the second one, uh, well, uh, 18 for patient three, etc. Why is it relevant and why is it different than what you see normally in other time series? First of all, we, the only thing we know that the patient was healthy in 2018 and fell sick in 2019, which means something happened between those two checkups, but we don't know exactly when. We'll get into my more, more formal definition of this concept uh, later, but that's a case of censoring. We don't observe a complete information. And the second important bit, uh, obviously, if we analyze a cohort of patients, what we are interested in is finding out when, from the moment we started observing them, conditional and other information, when did they fall sick? If, however, our study ended last year, we don't know what happened after that. And we still need to want, want to be able to draw some inference. And the thing is, we don't know, say for patient one, uh, okay, patient one is a bad example. Patient two, he was healthy throughout the entire sample, uh, entire period of observation. And then something, maybe they remained healthy throughout the entire year so far, or maybe they fell sick on January 2nd, 2022. We don't know, because this is the end of our observation period. If you are dealing in, with data, that can be cast into this kind of environment, uh, this kind of framework, sorry, then survival analysis is something you need to look at, or it is at least worth looking at. Basically, everything in survival analysis is about how long does it take for something to happen. Can be a good thing, can be a bad thing, dependently on context, but what matters is for each case we observe, there's a period of inactivity, as in nothing happening, and then it happens. And comparing different cohorts, we want to find, we want to dis decide what's the distribution of the time until it actually happens. Uh, censoring that I mentioned earlier, uh, we only know that time to event at least some duration. 
just to give you a brief example for context, how does it change across different applications? As I mentioned earlier, the actual event that we wait on can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. In clinical research, someone, someone falling sick, that's bad. Someone making a recovery, that's good. Uh, a chur churn, which is an example we'll be using later. Well, obviously, we are interested in our customer base remaining loyal to us. So if someone drops off, churns, uh, that's bad, etc. Uh, so that would be the basic introduction to survival analysis. Uh, unlike some of the previous episodes, this one requires a little, little bit, I promise to try to keep it to a minimum, of apparatus from probability theory here. There's three main objects that we need to be dealing with. Capital T, how the time random variable, because we don't know when it will happen, representing the time until the event, till recovery, discharge, sickness, whatever. Survival function, which is what's the probability that it's going to take longer than a certain time for the event to mature. Like for instance, the value of the, of the survival function at say three years or something means that's the probability the patient did not fall sick for three years. So it took long, at least three years for him to, 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 become, a, to become sick. Hazard function is a little bit more abstract mathematically. That relates to what we can see uh, in, uh, when we analyze the probability distribution in a little bit more detail. Rolling further. First, the time to event. Uh, as I said, that's a random variable representing how long it takes until something happens. Uh, it's not negative because, well, you can't say it will happen 10 minutes ago. Doesn't make sense grammatically, doesn't make sense mathematically. Uh, the three objects, the CDF, so probability that the, an event occurred at most up until time t, that would be the cumulative distribution function, that is an instantaneous probability that it happened precisely at that moment. And the probability that it happened later than, the, than a given observation time when we currently are, that's survival function. Uh, if we know every, if we could observe everything, so we knew all the time when things happen and we did not have the gaps, like I mentioned earlier, someone fell sick between two hour checkpoints, but we don't know, was it a second after the last one, a second before the previous, after the previous one or some point in between? Uh, well, that's not the situation we typically have to worry about, but in this context, we do. That's censoring. Censoring is pretty much what missing values are in uh, regular uh, regression problems. They are there. They are in the very nature of the problem, and we have to be able to do something about them. In general, the definition of censoring is that information is censored in, this our, con in our context if the if survival time is not fully known. Which means, uh, well, we can't use it directly the way we would if we were a regression model, but we still can infer something from them. Because to come back to a reformulation of the previous example, say case five here, that's the latest that we observe something. We don't know what happened afterwards, so we can't estimate the error, but we know it took at least up until this point to, for, well, for nothing to happen. So if anything happened, it was at least this duration of time. That's a case of right censoring. And that's the most that's the most common one in practice. We were running a clinical test, and at some point we had to stop. Uh, we have left censoring. We know something happened before we started measuring uh, or observing our phenomenon of interest, but we don't exactly know when. And that's when left censoring comes in. Uh, machine failure being a common example. Everything was fine when we set off and then things happen, but we don't know exactly when. And finally, we have interval censoring. We know at one point, like here, say, everyone was fine. At the end, everyone was fine. We don't know if that person remained healthy all the time or contracted a disease and then recovered. We, don't, we, we have no way of figuring it out. And still, we need to be able to draw some information, infer, draw some inference on this basis anyway. Or a simpler case, someone got 
say control group placebo, false sick, and then we observe it. Also, we don't exactly know when. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, because everything is right, because observations are censored, we know they were at least, they happened or didn't happen by a certain point, but we don't know when exactly, which means we cannot calculate errors in whatever model we propose. Hence, we cannot treat it as a direct regression problem. And if we attempt to just, well, fix something quickly and adjust for that, uh, usually we end up having to make some pretty strong implicit assumptions. Not a good idea. If you are interested in figuring out a little more than this ultra crash introduction, the Wikipedia article around this one is really excellent. So uh, mathematical object number two, survi uh, survival function. Survival function, as I mentioned earlier, that's the one minus cumulative distribution function for those of you who have been more exposed to probability theory, meaning survival function at, at, at certain value means the probability that it took at least this long for the phenomenon to occur. Or in other words, probability it hasn't occurred by this time. Uh, there are different ways, as usual, in statistics with handling this problem. We have, or handling this problem, approaching this kind of problem. So we can have parametric, where you assume a certain probability distribution. We, you can have semi-parametric, which is sort of hybrid. You make some assumptions, but not, not specify a parametric form of distribution. And non-parametric, uh, which is what you pretty much estimate as a function of time. Sort of like if you remember the episode about profit as a modeling class, mm, this is what non-parametric statistics kind of is. Uh, by the way, keeping in keeping in, uh, in line with the time series theme, why am I starting with a, a simple estimator of curve fitting? Sort of what we did with other time series models. You start with something simple where you just model it as a function of time, pretty much curve fitting. Then we are going to move to linear models, which is always, which is the simplest thing you can do in just about any context. And then we move to trees. I mean, for those of you wondering, did I miss out on deep learning? No, I didn't. There, you can you can force survival models into the deep learning framework, but that would probably justify a separate episode in its own right. So I skipped it for this time. Uh, rolling along. The simplest thing we can do, the Kaplan-Meier estimator. We just look at the, at the observed data at each checkpoint that we have. Uh, say this is probably a good one. We, have, we could have checkpoint here. At each point, we count how many possible uh, patients were at risk and how of the, many of them fell sick. So we have a few times where we observe things. And at each of them, how many... Uh, for how many did the event occur? They uh, they they fell sick. They churned as customers, etc. And we can normalize it as a proportion. How many were exposed at all? Multiply it over all the points in time. Voila. Uh, how do we actually apply this in practice? Uh, what we do is I'm going to be using the data set on customer churn in uh, telecommunication. You can find the link here. This is what a typical data set like this would look like. Customer ID, a bunch of uh, characteristics, gender, senior citizen, what kind of lines they had, payment methods, etc. Importantly, tenure. Tenure, as far as we are concerned, that's the duration of the event because that's the time that's sort of associated with each case, that the scale on which we measure what happened. And uh, well, ever since the start of someone's tenure, say this person has been with the company for 34 months and they have not churned. So that's already an observation. Okay, at 34, at time, time, and time point, at time point 34, there is one observation where someone was not churned. Uh, the first thing we do with Kaplan, et cetera, all the other features. The thing about Kaplan Meyer is this is a simplest starting point. We are assuming, kind of like what we did with a starting point in profit, that time is the only part that matters. So we are ignoring uh, all the explanatory variables. Uh, well, not completely, we'll be using them later, but ignoring for the formulation of a model, which means we only need two things. We need tenure, because that's our measurement of time. And we need an indicator for churn. 
and then we pull all those you could you could think of it as individual time series for all for each individual for each user we lump them together and we draw inference on a population basis we specify those two we we invoke a method from lifelines that's why i install that's why i in, installed those at the beginning kaplan meyer fitter if you've done one scikit model, scikit learn model in your life, then you know how that uh, works going forward. Uh, and this is what we get. What do we see on this graph? Because stopping for a moment, uh, it's uh, to interpret it. It's probably a good idea. On the horizontal axis, time. It ends at 70 because that is the maximal value of churn, that maximal value of tenure that we've seen at sample, which means we don't know what happened for people who have been uh, customers for longer than 70 months. Uh, vertical axis is probability. Mean, and how do we interpret it? At each point, we can say, okay, the probability that a customer who has been with a current company say, well, for zero months, uh, hasn't churned, well, that's obvious. They don't churn right away. At 10 months, the probability that they haven't churned, that's going to be, what, 0.86 or something like this. Eventually, everybody leaves for whatever reason, and that's why this function is increasing. Is decreasing. At 20 months, the probability that someone did not, hasn't churned so far, 80%. At 30 months, uh, uh, say 78, etc. As a nice bonus to get a feel of the sample sizes that we are dealing with, uh, the graph gives us also how many cases were at risk, meaning the number of potential uh, customers who could have churned when they were left in the population, How for how many we don't know what happened beyond this point, and how many events occurred. And well, direction of the changes is obvious. Censored is increasing, events is increasing, at risk is decreasing because people keep dropping off. Uh, the way this might come in handy if you want to draw some inference is, uh, well, the, those bits I mentioned earlier, if, you, if you're interested about getting a measure of uncertainty, in the interest of time, just read the entry, this entry linked here on the exponential formula. It's using a, a delta approximation to derive approximate distribution for this estimator. If we want to have a look at in, a, in more detail at what's going on in the population, uh, we can break it down by some of the categorical variables. Because remember, Kaplan-Meier all by itself ignores explanatory covariates. It assumes everyone is the same and they should be treated as such. Excuse me for one second. I seem to have a little bit of a Bob the Builder in the neighborhood. Um, how can we do it? We use our, we take a look at our original data frame and we say we want to split by see if, if there's if the payment method by which they were paying the, tele the telecom company, uh, does that have impact on the characteristics of the users in terms of their survival? Pretty simple, st pretty standard, uh, well, Panda stuff. We subset the data frame, fit the Kaplan-Meier for each subgroup, and then plot it jointly. As you can see, those paying by electronic check, they drop off fastest. So for them, the probability of not having churned uh, that decreases very quickly, which means they are probably not the, among the most loyal customers. Uh, where is for other methods, that is a little different depending on the, on the type of payment structure used. Then, what can we do uh, in terms of, well, that, I mean, graph-based graph comparisons are nice. But sometimes it's useful to actually verify the intuition because you, know, you, stare at, you stare at a graph long enough, you're bound to see pretty much everything you want to see in there. Uh, so maybe we would like to compare whether the two methods that seem pretty close in the graph, so bank transfer and credit card, as you can see the green and the yellow, they are pretty close most of the time. Uh, we can verify that intuition. Are they actually... Uh, meaningfully different. Log rank tests, 
uh, log rank test is the sort of primary tool you can do to do you can apply to that purpose so you uh, calculate the characteristics of the two, two groups and then run it on parametric test what this gives you is the not the null hypothesis is that the survival curves are identical and the h1 is that they are significantly different p-value way above significance level no reason to reject the null so we are cool with that uh, can we look at per, all the pairwise comparisons so that's uh, I'm personally i'm a huge fan of looking at diagnostic statistics like that uh, if someone does the heavy work for me of writing the wrapper around it and that's what we can do as you can see we can automatically compare all possible pairs so bank transfer against the other free credit against the other two etc and as you can see credit card and bank transfer are the only two that where we cannot reject the null of the curves being identical in all the other combinations which was kind of to be expected from the original graph blue against red blue against uh, green etc the null of the curves being identical rejected very very strongly to summarize this part uh, it's pretty flexible the kaplan meyer estimator minimal assumptions we just need to observe some sensor data it's fast uh, the issue is it's not terribly useful for prediction because we don't uh, we cannot incorporate any covariates so the only thing you can say in terms of prediction is really we assume that the future distribution will be the same as it's been in the past which is not necessarily true uh since there are no questions let me proceed to the to the next part uh, so I, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment but uh, yeah just reminding you guys if you have any questions please feel free to ask in the youtube chat uh moving forward uh hazard function if you recall we specified here the survival function s so the opposite of the uh, cumulative distribution function, we can derive two characteristics out of our survival function. We can take the uh, derivative of a logarithm, so minus derivative over the function itself, and the cumulative hazard rate, which is how they are connected. Uh, the way to think about it, hazard rate is sort of the exponential rate at which a risk of something bad happening our event of interest accumulates over time this part is a mathematical way to formalize it and the reason it pays off to uh, specify to start thinking in those terms using a quantity that's directly related to our original because we had s survival function and this is how it links to the server to the hazard rate is that hazard rate it's a little easier to estimate and uh, to specify if you remember at the beginning i said that we'll be going through a sort of usual evolution of the of a machine learning model or statistical model we start with something simple and parametric just curve fitting then we move to regression or, or a linear model and this is a necessary intermediate step because it's just much easier to parameterize we have the hazard rate we estimate it using the same notation as before at each point in time what's the proportion of people who experience the event divided by the number overall size of the population and we sum it over time uh, yeah as i mentioned total amount of risk to speak informally uh, accumulated up to this point in time and we'll see why it's useful when we can use it to construct the simplest uh, regression model for survival analysis namely cox regression how can we do something how, what do we do about it in practice same setup as before we have a column specifying the time to event and we have a column specifying whether the event happened when when or whether the event happened uh, we invoke a method called nelson allen that's the most popular and parametric estimator for the hazard rate and voila this is important uh, this one is important to remember that despite the shape being sort of similar this is not cumulative distribution function so this is not probability really uh, so the hazard rate it's kind of important it's, it's not very meaningful in isolation it's important if you are comparing characteristics for two group 
because then you can say, okay, this one is twice more at risk than the other one. Sort of like looking at coefficients in a single variance, a single variable regression. On its own, not super important. One versus the other, yes, more so. Again, we can do the similar exercises before and compare the relative risk rate as it evolves over time for the different subgroups. This entire bit is useful because we want to get to, uh, well, actual models that involve varying something, of, uh, well, time varying covariates. So we are more in statistics machine learning territory. Uh, the simplest thing we can do is we have a so-called Cox regression model, pretty much says that your hazard rate, some baseline hazard curve, plus exponent of a linear model. So you could think of it as a log linear model for uh, the hazard rate. Uh, effect is constant over time. That's the relevant bit to remember. Uh, works with right sensor data. So the kind of data that well we most frequently encounter in practice because medical type of study, we were in a study, we don't know what happened afterwards except that the patient survived until the end of the period. This is what we can, uh, this is what we can actually look at. Uh, we need to process the data a little bit uh, because, well, it's a linear model, so we can't do the usual thing of dumping, just dumping everything and hoping for the best. We need to convert it to dummies, split to train and test, call pH fitter the usual way, and this is the fitted model. Uh, we'll get to the summary in a sec. What can we say about the model? I mean, the sort of intuition, What? how do you measure whether your survival model is actually any good? And the popular choice, so-called concordance index, best way to think about it, it's, it's kind of like a re under the curve. So is the order of ranking correct uh, weighted over time? That's sort of the best intuition that I have come up with. Kind of like with ranking, if you have observations sorted a certain way that gives you, say, a UC of whatever, 0.8, if you multiply every observation by 5 and add 20, or in general apply a monotone transform, uh, your AUC will not change. The only thing it cares about is the ordering, and that's the same thing that uh, concordance index does. Uh, we can see which... Uh, coefficients, uh, which variables are most important in our context with the usual setup. So coefficient, exponent of the coefficient, because remember, they are impacting the hazard rate in a multiplicative manner. Upper, lower end of the con interval, uh, z-test for uh, statistical significance, etc. What can we say about the individual risk factors? And this is one I personally like, because on this graph, it's kind of easier why it matters. Having a phone service above the baseline of zero, zero, so in a multiplicative manner, having no impact. If someone has a phone service, yes, that, that impacts uh, the hazard rate, you know, it, that increases the hazard rate. If someone is senior, uh, a bit less likely. If they have a two year contract, they are very, very, they are far less likely than baseline to flip. Because as you can see, this variable has a huge negative impact on the hazard rate, which means it, it proportionally shrinks it. And finally, and that's that's why I said it's it's bear with me because we will get to prediction. We don't just predict point-wise uh, a point value. We can predict entire survival curve for a given patient or customer in this instance. And how how do we do it? Quite simply predict survival function, and voila, over the maximum available horizon going forward, we get the entire survival curve. And this is the kind of thing we would get. And then you can, of course, compare the, the your patients. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I'm not completely certain why it started repeating the colors in the palette. Uh, but for each individual patient, uh, case, we get the survival curve for this case. So you can see that, for instance, this one is, yeah, super loyal customer, not likely to churn at all. But yes, this one probably can't wait to get their food out the door. We can look a little closer in terms of what the impact is 
and group the predicted uh, uh, outcomes by uh, covariate. And this is how you do it. Plot partial effects on outcome. While it's a little bit of a pain to spell it while typing, um, I think it's worth the effort because you get a very nice and interpretable uh, way of looking at things if you familiarize your, once you have familiarized yourself with the survival analysis a little bit. And in this instance, we see the baseline, someone having a one-year contract, that's our baseline, and this shrinks indeed rather quickly, but people with two-year contract makes an enormous difference because those are way, way more likely to remain loyal. Uh, as I mentioned, we start with a non-parametric estimator for the survival function. Then we move to a slightly more involved mathematical representation via the hazard rate. And then we a uh, linear model. Once you get that, historically, what came next? Ensembles of trees. Uh, you can adapt, well, XGBoost, LGBM, CADBoost, whatever your, your weapon of choice is as well. But... For, this, for simplicity of demonstration, I am using a random forest. Random forest, for pretty much the same way, in pretty much the same way as XGBoost, can be adapted to survival context. I mean, if you think about it, what is an, what is XGBoost doing? It's, it's running a regression, fitting the best line at the bottom of the tree. Except when we move to survival analysis, well, we're not, it's not a regression, it's a survival model or Cox, or Cox regression. And that's what conditional survival forest is. And that's the reason we needed the Pi survival uh, package. Because full disclosure, I really, really didn't feel like writing this one from scratch. How do we do it? In much the same manner we would have used a regular uh, random forest model because uh, we add we need to add an extra column indicating whether the certain whether this event is censored or not and uh, what we what we get as a prediction out of the conditional survival forest model is the probability that this will happen by this time in long story short fairly similar syntax to your baseline random forest with the addition that you need you need to specify an extra column and define what's time, which one is time, which one is churn. So did it occur? And if, if it, when did it? And if so, when did it occur? As you can see, standard stuff, uh, X train, so training our, our covariates, time of event, and what was the nature of the event? Did it occur, did it not occur? Uh, once we have run the model, we can, uh, well, start by calculating the concordance index. How well is it doing in terms of uh, the performance of the model? Breer score is a normalized version of the uh, concordance model. Concordance index, 0 0.93. Well, I've seen worse, if you think of it, if, as I said, if you think, continue thinking of it as a time-weighted version of the AUC. Uh, Breer score, what's the average discrepancy between the churn status and the probability, which is <sighs> intuitively it's sort of mean squared error on the zeros once, whether something happened or not, and the predicted probabilities. It's not ideal, but it is a little more intuitive than, than some of the others. Uh, we, can we can go and calculate also well more, more elaborate metrics, as you can see here. Uh, compared to actual uh, test, our predicted values. And here you get, well, the other metrics, which can also which can also come in handy if predicting the actual distribution and seeing, okay, it's, it's, it's not enough for me that we got the ordering right. We also need to look at how it's going with the actual values. Then looking at mean squared error, median absolute error, etc., is probably also quite a good idea. Uh, from the silence I gathered, there don't they are not that there are not that many questions. So I'll probably continue. Uh, that seems to be the peril of talking about those kinds of things on a Friday afternoon, I, I suppose. Uh, a final application that we'll talk about for survival models is customer lifetime value. 
that is a pretty popular topic if you're dealing with anything related to e-commerce or the kinds of business that I am mentioning here as uh, as examples. Because what we want to know is, well, how loyal are our, not just how loyal are our customers and when they are likely to drop off, because that would be purely survival analysis or vintage survival analysis. But we also want to find out uh, how, well, we don't have time to chase everyone who's likely to drop off. And we would like to know, well, if five people who spend, I don't know, thousand euro per, per year are drop off, it's probably a smaller problem than if one guy who spends 50,000 a year drops off. In other words, not all customers are equal. We want to be able to, to rank them, not just by the probability of ranking, but all of uh, the faction of dropping off, but also how, how big of a loss will their departure be? Uh, what you want to uh, distinguish with, for starters, is how frequently people visit the store. You can have someone who's super frequent and then nothing happened. And if this guy hasn't showed up in, a, in for this period, yeah, there's probably something off. Maybe he dropped off. Maybe he's very likely to churn or has churned already. On the other hand, if this lady who has been uh, visiting far less frequently, well, not that huge of a deal. It's, she's actually, she's probably not due for her another, for another visit yet. And what's important is attempting to distinguish between those two situations. So that's uh, what, that's what we, that, that those are the two technical assumptions, I guess, or business assumptions we need to make here. We want, before we look at customers who actually did purchase something, at least once, because without it, well, there's uh, twice technically, because we need to say something about at least one waiting time. A way to phrase it, people who had at least one repeat purchase. And the second thing is uh, churn. So those people dropping off. If they're gone, they're gone. And we don't know when it happened. Because, well, we have to assume something to simplify the situation, which is not terribly simple to begin with. Uh, what we can do is we can, we aggregate this information to look at the patterns for each customer and the value that is associated with this pattern. Uh, a sort of popular model, model, despite a pretty horrible acronym, is the beta geometric negative binomial distribution. <coughs> that refers to the distribution of the waiting times between um, purchases per customers, because we assume that their, that their uh, temporal patterns vary, and the values, how much they actually how much do they actually purchase, because this guy may, is probably shopping a little less since it's so frequent, and this lady who's less frequent is likely to be buying a little more, or maybe the other way around. We don't know, but it's reasonable to assume that they are different. So, uh, What's the value of a customer for a given period? The number of transactions we expect to occur times the expected average value of each purchase. Uh, what we do is uh, we assume that the number of transactions follows a Poisson process, which is pretty much in statistical probability. If you don't know what to do about arrival times, you start by Poisson process until something proves otherwise. Distribution of value, gamma, so a non-negative distribution which can capture a lot of things. Well, because we are not modeling negative purchases. Technically, we could with returns, but we can we are ignoring it for now. And they are churning according to a geometric distribution. Hence, all those components put together. A popular format, for, uh, which we'll demonstrate in a sec, is uh, RFM, Recency Frequency Monetary Value. So we format the data in such a manner that each customer is represented by a combination of those factors. How recent was the uh, last purchase? To reflect the fact that, like I said, it's been longer for this guy and less for this lady. Frequency, how concentrated, how concentrated were they in time? And what was the value last time that we saw them? Uh, I used a subset of the merchant category recommendation data from a Kaggle competition, because what else? Uh, this is what the raw data looks like. Well, we, we, we assume you are your card, so identify users by the card ID. Purchase amount, 
bless their hearts for some reason they decided to go for logarithms i think one point and this is the time range brief description of the data what lifetimes helps us with if we want to model clv type of uh, data there is literally a function called summary from transaction data and it formats the data frame that we have here into the uh, rfm recency frequency monetary value format we just need to specify the input data frame targets and frequency you could achieve that if you have the patience uh, by doing a bunch of pandas manipulations yourself but if someone else was kind enough to do it for you and and create this model then you know why reinvent the wheel and this is the format that we get for each customer of whom we don't know are they churned now or not based on their behavior that's what we are trying to decide for the, based on a time series of observations for this customer should we worry or not really uh, we split the data into training and test combination uh, again using the built-in functionality of which i'm a huge fan so if you guys check out lifetimes on, on github give those good people a star uh, this is what we get as explanatory variables call the distribution call the fitter so very very similar syntax as as in lifelines where we started started earlier penalizer best way to think about it uh, regularize it so it doesn't go too wild and this gives us a fitted model what can we say about this model well it kind of captures something but it misses very badly misses out very badly I mean, keep in mind i just used parameters pulled out of the blue uh, misses badly the number of customers uh, who had very few calibration periods which kind of makes sense if you think about it uh, well because we don't have an awful lot of information it's sort of the same as with looking at prediction of click behavior for people who have barely any history uh, we can generate predictions for for a specific customer how do we do it we select which one we want to go so whatever row 13 Th those are the characteristics of this customer expressed in the rfm format and then we run a prediction at this frequency for this customer what is the number of transactions that we are going to allow it arrive at so in terms of crash introduction to survival analysis which admittedly is a little bit of a left field topic for for time series not what people usually talk about in this context i guess that would be it for the for today i hope you found it interesting and once more apologies about the hiccup and shifting from from yesterday well, thank you thank you very much conrad i still don't see any questions so probably it was too easy for everyone <laughs> and but, it's friday afternoon and it's friday afternoon yeah <laughs> probably that's the reason so the video is going to be online, so you can see it anytime you want. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Conrad on Twitter or LinkedIn or and just Con ask on... And, and on Discord. And on Discord, I had a bit and of a drop, Discord, but yeah. I, am, I am back on active duty on Discord. Great. So, yeah. And apologies for yesterday. I hope it doesn't happen in the future. No. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think we have to um, upload yesterday's video. No, I think it's safe. Say it, it can be safely designed to the dustbin of designated to the dustbin of history. Yes, sure. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Everyone if you have any joining. questions, do ask, and we will share the social media links and uh, also the notebook. Notebook has already been shared in the chat. I can see, and we will also share the link to notebook and social media links of Conrad uh, after after this video gets uploaded and processed. And it will be as a pinned comment. Thank you so much, Conrad. Have a great Thanks. weekend. Thank you, you too.